Tonight's keynote speaker has dedicated much of his life to the field of law. His impressive resume includes over 30 years of service at New Scotland Yard. As the commander of the London Police Service, he focused on national counterterrorism. Milton has held many positions, including National Coordinator of Port <coughs> Policing, Chair of the United Kingdom Border Agency Working Group, the Security Commander of the Metropolitan Police, and the Director of Intelligence, International Terrorism, and Head of National Terrorist Funding Unit. Milton retired in 2005 and began working supporting countries, especially in Asia, who are facing terrorism threats on a national level. He provided high-level training to improve human rights as well as counterterrorism activities. Currently, he is involved at Bay Path with the American Women's College program as a professor of criminal justice. He's developing courses in counterterrorism and security for the online program. It is my honor to introduce to you now Commander Robert Milton. <clears throat> thank you very much. That was very kind. Thank you. Something magical is going to happen in a minute, I hope. Welcome. I am used to speaking to senior police officers. You lot are a lot more scary, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, it's absolutely my pleasure to welcome you here tonight. Um, this is a big occasion for you and for Bay Path University. This is an occasion for you to make the right choice about where your career is going to go. And the fact you are thinking of having a career in criminal justice is something that I think is very special. I've dedicated my whole life to criminal justice. And when I talk about justice, and it's interesting tonight is justice and science, we need to be clear about what we mean. Justice is about supporting victims. Those people who have suffered a crime, perhaps the family members of people who have suffered a crime. That's what the job's all about. It's giving them some support and understanding. It's, it's helping them get over traumatic events. But it's not, it doesn't just stop there. It's actually about making sure that our criminal justice system works and works well, and that only the bad people get put into prison, that we don't have miscarriages of justice. And what we're seeing is that science is playing a more and more important role in ensuring that we are finding out the truth about what is happening, the truth of a crime. Has anyone been following the Oscar Pistorius trial in South Africa? Because there is a good example of, I don't know what happened, and I've been following it. The forensics was terrible, a lot of contamination, a lot of misunderstanding. Do we really think that that system has worked, that we really understand what was the truth of what happened on that terrible night for Pistorius and for his girlfriend? I don't think we do. So actually, the criminal justice system is all about getting into the truth. But science doesn't just stop there. It goes way beyond that. It goes about trying to prevent crime in the first place. Science can really help us prevent crime. It can help us understand why criminals commit crime. It can help us protect our property. And then it can also help us on the other side of it. It can help us recover from when we are attacked and we do have a crime against us. So it's much broader than simply collecting evidence and taking people to court. Now, I have to apologize to you for my picture in that brochure you've got. It is the worst <laughs> selfie I've ever seen in the world. And the fact you have bothered to turn up after seeing that picture is remarkable, okay? Absolutely awful. Now, what I want to do is, today, is I want to give you something to think about. I want to get you thinking about where does my career lie in criminal justice? And I thought about this, and I thought about how can I do that, and I've decided what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a case history of a terrible event that happened in London in July 2005. 
And I'm going to take you through that event quite quickly because we haven't got much time. And I'm hoping somebody at the back is going to shout at me when I start getting near 7 o'clock because you've got to go somewhere else at 7 o'clock. But I think by doing this, you can start thinking in your mind, well, where can I fit into that? What, what can I offer the criminal justice system in trying to respond to these terrible, terrible events? Okay? So that's what we're going to do today. Now, I make no apologies for this. You will see some disturbing photographs. You will see disturbing photographs of damage to the trains. You will not see any victims. I've taken those pictures out because that's not appropriate for tonight. But you will see disturbing photographs. That's the reality of criminal justice. Crime is nasty. Okay? And I think it's right that you should see that so you can understand just how difficult some of the problems we face in relation to criminal justice. And I hope my little device here works. Right. So first I'm going to ask you a question. Who was the greatest detective? Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock, who said Sherlock Holmes? <laughs> right, straight, fast track, degree, don't have to do the course. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes. But he wasn't real, was he, Sherlock Holmes? He was invented by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. But Arthur Conan Doyle was incredible. He got Sherlock Holmes using fingerprints 11 years before Scotland Yard did. <laughs> he was a visionary. And there he is. Now, I'm going to let you into a little secret. And I don't want Dr. Leary at the back to hear this. Okay. But if you come to Bay Path, no, that's not right. When you come to Bay Path, <laughs> and you have an opportunity of speaking to the president, Dr. Carol Leary, Tell her you like this man. <laughs> because Dr. Carol Leary has the hots for Benedict Cumberbatch. <laughs> You're guaranteed to get in, okay? All right, okay. So, pioneer of forensics. Pioneer of science and criminal justice. But let's talk about something serious now. Let's talk about the London bombings. We are going to fly through this. Normally I would say to you, if you have a question for me, ask a bit. But if you do that, we won't get past the first slide. So any questions, I'll happily try and deal with at the end. I'll try and leave some time at the end, OK? We're going to fly through this. But remember, I want you to be thinking about where do I, where does my career, potential career, fit in and where can I support a response to a terrible incident like this? 2005, July 2005 in London, one month after I retired from the police service. Now, that is good timing for you. I felt terrible about it. I'd planned the last three years on how we were going to respond to this and then I retired. And I actually got told about this when I was on top of a, a, of a uh, in, in Iceland, on top of a glacier. I can't get a mobile phone signal at my house, but on top of this glacier and iceberg, I suddenly got four, three bars, and my phone rang. <laughs> What's this all about? And it was my daughter, who's a police officer, telling me there's been a terrible attack in London. 2005, what happened? Let me outline the attack. Let me tell you a bit about our response. Let me tell you about the gathering of the evidence, I think, which would be probably the thing that is most of interesting to you. How we investigated it. And finally, why did it happen? All those things are very relevant to criminal justice and very relevant to the science of criminal justice. So what actually happened? What was the scale of this attack? Four separate bombings. Three on the London Underground. Who's been in London? Who's been on the Underground? You know what it's like. Trains that travel deep underground in very small tunnels. One on a London bus. It's very interesting to understand, and I'll tell you later, why one was on a London bus. 
And here's a, a map of central London. Round about here is the Palace of Westminster, the Parliament. Scotland Yard is around about here. All this is very much central London, very, very busy place. Just about here is a place called King's Cross, and that becomes very relevant in a minute. These are the scenes of the four bombings. Edgware Road, Russell Square, Allgate, and Tavershot Square. Let's have a look at the first one. Scene one in Allgate. Seven people died, 90 people injured. Now, first thing to show you there, that is a laser image of the train after it was damaged. And that's really important to us. I'm not clever enough to tell you how they do it. But by taking a laser picture, they're able to manipulate it, get inside it, look around it, and particularly find out exactly where the bomb was. Because you can see where the blast has gone. This is what happened on that train. There, standing there, is one of the suicide terrorists. Now what you need to understand is that when this happened, we didn't know what was going on. We did not know whether this was a suicide attack, we did not know whether this was somebody just putting a device down and running away. There was total confusion. But eventually, through the excellent work of the scientists, we managed to piece together exactly what happened on these trains. And you can see, we now know that Tan Weir, one of the terrorists, was standing there and he had a backpack, a rucksack with explosives in it and he was holding it in front of him. And in fact, the witnesses say he was fiddling about inside trying to detonate it. You'll notice that all the people were, that were killed were standing up. The ones that were seriously injured, and they were seriously injured, we're looking at people who have lost limbs here, okay, they were generally sitting down. I told you I was going to show you some disturbing pictures and these are the pictures of inside the carriage. You can see how the blast has completely opened up the train. These are substantial trains. And the problem with explosives is that they generate huge amounts of gas that accelerate very, very quickly and it's the blast that kills you. And it's the blast that has to escape somewhere. And if you can imagine this train is in a tunnel, where is that blast going to go? It bounces around inside the train, inside the tunnel, and it causes terrible injuries. The second scene was in Edgware Road. Here we lost eight people, 185 people injured. And here, Mohammed Sadiq Khan, he sat down. Mohammed Sadiq Khan was 30 years of age and he was the leader of the terrorist group. Again, the people standing were the ones that were killed. Mohammed Sadiq Khan was very clever and he waited for another train to come by before he detonated his bomb. Again, laser images of inside the tunnel damage to the train. This is, sorry, we're going to go to the next one now. So now we're into scene three, which is Russell Square. Russell Square was the deepest of the tunnels and the worst scene to have to deal with. And you can see here, 26 people died. 344 injured. And again, that's what I'm telling you about how small these tunnels are. So the blast has nowhere to go. That's why so many people were killed in Russell Square. Whole side of the train has been taken out. Final one was the bus. Now the bus attack happened an hour later, which initially caused us a great deal of confusion. Why did we have three attacks within minutes of each other and the last attack an hour later. Came along this road, turned right, and he detonated just there. This is a London bus. Those who have been in London know there are open top buses sightseeing. This is not an open top bus. The roof was completely blown off. Again, this is inside the bus. Hussein is sitting here. These are the people 
that were killed. That's the lower deck, he was on the upper deck. Now I want to just stop and look at that scene for a minute. One of the disciplines of, of forensic science is being able to go to a scene and meticulously gather the evidence. Where do you start with a scene like that? Because the bomb and everything else associated with the bomb is thrown up hundreds of yards. It's the most difficult thing to try and deal with, but you have to deal with it. And we would go into the center, we'd make our way into the center, carefully picking our way so we don't disturb any of the evidence, and then we would meticulously work our way out. And we're looking at what happens in the trees. The trees collect a lot of the debris, the buildings, the guttering. They're all being parts of the bomb and sadly, parts of people as well. This is what forensic science is about. This is the real challenge for forensic science, managing that type of scene. This is the British Medical Association building. It was right opposite the bus when it was, when it was exploded, the bomb was exploded. Had, the, had it not been there, many more people would have been killed because in this building were doctors and nurses and they rushed out and they managed to preserve life. And there are all the people that were killed in the attack. 56 dead, including the four terrorists. Now at the time, we still didn't know what had happened. So this is where criminal justice, forensic science, and all the other sciences all come together to try and understand what has happened. Because we need to know as quickly as possible why this has happened, who has done it. We don't know if there's, not, there's going to be other attacks. We are trying to manage panic in London here. So the sooner we start to understand what has happened here, the sooner we can start to deal with the impact of the terrorist attack. So let's just summarize what we've got. We have four crime scenes, one in the open air, three underground, one very deep underground. We have many people dead and we have hundreds of injuries. We are trying to get them out. Our priority number one is preservation of life. We are trying to get those people out. We're trying to get them to hospital. We have no idea what has happened. All we know, there have been four explosions. Terrible access to the crime scenes. Apart from the bus, where we can get to, the underground trains, extremely difficult. And as one police officer said in the interview afterwards, this was hell on earth. So forget about CSI. Who watches CSI? <coughs> this isn't CSI. This is reality. Okay? This is reality. The problems we had were immediately health and safety for those officers and support staff, scientists, going down into the tunnels trying to gather the evidence. We had vermin, we had rats everywhere. We had asbestos. Asbestos is a very nasty substance that gets into your lungs and can kill you. We had carbon monoxide gas, terrible heat. Believe it or not, even in London in July, the summer, it gets hot occasionally. It was a very hot day and underground it was even hotter. We had infections and we had massive welfare issues. These people going down into this, these crime scenes had to be managed and looked after because they would be traumatized about what they were seeing. This is one of our exhibits officers meticulously going through the rubble and he's looking for fragments of the bomb because we need to reconstruct that bomb. We need to find as many bits of it as possible. Because if we can put that bomb back together, we can probably identify who built it. Because bombs have signatures on them. 
we could certainly find out who trained the person to build it. We might get DNA off of it. We might get fingerprints off of it. So we're looking to try and piece together that bomb so we can use it as evidence against the people that carried out this attack. Because these people will have help. The four suicide terrorists died, but there's a whole network around them. Okay. And this is the meticulous work that the scientists and the police officers do in gathering the evidence. Painstakingly meticulous work in collecting everything, searching thoroughly, not missing a single thing. This is a forward reception point set up in the underground station. So all the exhibits, so if you find what you think is a fragment of bomb, you collect it, you label it, you document where you've picked it up, you take a photograph of it, and you hand it to these people, and then it goes up the chain, and it would eventually go to a scientist in a laboratory who will start doing DNA on it, fingerprinting, try and identify what it is. And then you get somebody else who's an expert in bomb making, gets all the pieces, and will slowly fit it together. And this is, this is taking weeks and weeks and weeks to do, but it's vital that we do this. And after a while, it got to a point we could no longer close the tunnel. Because what we're trying to do is get London back moving again. So in the end, the best solution was to wrap the trains up, get a crane, lift them out, put them on a lorry, drive them to another place where we continued with the forensics of them. And these trains are still now stored they're still undergoing tests, they're still undergoing examination. It's taking that long to deal with. So what about the suspects? Because very, very quickly, the police officers in charge of investigating this need to know who the suspects are. So identifying them is important. And this is where scientists, experts coming in can say, we think the seat of the explosion was there, and from what we are seeing, we're pretty sure that that person, that remains there, that body there, was the bomber. Now, interestingly, all four bombers were carrying identification. They wanted us to know who they were. They wanted the glory of, I, I carried out this attack. So we got them fairly quickly. And here they are, Mohammed Sadiq Khan, 30 years of age. His job was a teaching assistant. He taught six and seven year olds in a school. Is he your typical terrorist? His number two was Shazad Tanweer, he was 22. And then we had two very young men, 18 and 19. All of them from England. Not coming from outside, all of them from England. Then we had to identify the victims. Now I spoke to you just now about justice, and justice is about supporting victims. And one of the things we need to do urgently is identify who's been killed, who are the injured, because can you imagine what's happening? We're getting phone calls from people panicking. I don't know where my husband is. I don't know where my daughter is. And we're having to match what they're saying to us with the people that we know have been killed and the people in hospital. Because there may be people in hospital who are unconscious, who cannot tell us who they are. Because their identification may have been blown away, and that happens a lot. So trying to get that together, trying to accurately identify who the victims are is really important. Because you're trying to minimize the impact here. So the sooner I can tell you that your husband is in this hospital, and he's okay, the better it is. The sooner I can identify who's been killed, the better it's going to be. So it's a big operation doing that. And again, it's the scientists that play the big part here. And I'm going to show you in a minute the resilience mortuary about where we got, took all the, the poor dead bodies, the victims, to identify them. And this didn't happen by chance, okay? This was planned. 
We knew that if we had a terrible incident in central London, we would need to have a purpose-built resilience mortuary. And this was put up within 24 hours. And you can see it has freezers because it's in July and we need to store the body somewhere. You can see it has a body examination area, exhibits where the bodies first come in, and very importantly, there is a family viewing area because we want to manage the victims and the victims' families. We need them to identify these, the victims, but we want to do it compassionately. And this is inside a very sterile area because one of the things, the enemy of forensic science, the enemy of the scientists is contamination. This is what's happened in Oscar, Oscar Pistorius's crime case. Too much contamination. We have to avoid it by any way we can. So we have absolute sterile areas to avoid the contamination. And inside, everybody undergoes a certain level of forensic examination. We are looking for traces of the explosives because this gas that gets blasted out will get in people's hair, get in their skin, get in their clothing. So we have to identify what that is. And that helps us understand where they were. And this is a scene from inside the exhibits room. And these people come from every part of criminal justice. You'll have, you've got doctors here, you've got pathologists here, you've got police officers here, you've got dentists here, you've got photographers, all working together to help identify who the victims are and to recover the evidence because these people had bits of the bomb inside them and we wanted that back. And we also had exhibits officers at the hospitals because if you're undergoing an, an operation in the hospital because you have been hit by some shrapnel, then we need to have that shrapnel back. So the whole evidential chain is, across, is working closely with the whole of the medical service to make sure that we can gather all the evidence. We have x-ray machines, and this poor person here had a nail blown into his head. Fingerprints, absolutely crucial. Another vital part of the criminal justice system is identification of people through fingerprints. Everything is photographed, everything is logged, so we know exactly what it is and where it's come from. And that is Mohammed Sadiq Khan. Now, he didn't, we didn't find him like that. We've picked him up from inside the underground carriage and a doctor and a pathologist sat down and pieced him together. But by doing that, we could determine exactly where the bomb was, which was just here. Okay? Very important for us to do that. So, what about the investigation? This is where a whole brand new set of scientists play a big part. Because what we need to do is establish exactly who these people are and what were their movements before the attack. And if we go back to my favorite detective, Sherlock Holmes, he said the best way is to work backwards from a problem. So we knew that at 8 o'clock, Mohammed Sadiq Khan was in that underground carriage. What we now needed to know is how did he get there? And how do you think we, we found out how he got into that underground station? Yeah, cameras. cameras. Brilliant. CCTV. London is the most camera. We've got more cameras in London than anywhere else. You cannot walk down a street in London without being on about four or five different cameras. If you drive into central London, your vehicle is automatically red. The vehicle license plate is automatically red and is stored somewhere. So now we have a real problem on our hands. We have got to start examining lots and lots and lots of CCTV. And eventually, this is what we found. This is at King's Cross Station. And just coming through in a few minutes, 
are the four terrors. One, two, three, four. This is a few minutes before the attack took place. Sadly, we haven't got a camera on when they split up because what they were meant to have done was they were meant to have gone north, south, east and west. Three of them went south, east and west. One of them couldn't go north because the northbound train wasn't running properly and there were too many people on the platform. He couldn't get down. But the other three went off and got into their underground trains and detonated their bombs. So now we know they're at King's Cross. So now the hard work starts. And this is where scientists and police officers working together meticulously can start piecing the whole thing together. So we identified that they actually got a train from a place called Luton, about 30 minutes away to get to King's Cross. There they are going into the station at Luton, and they're the other two. There they are on the actual platform at Luton. Here they are arriving at the Luton outside the station. So the next question is, how did they get to Luton station? There we are. We have a camera in the car park and we see them by a car. That's the car. So we now have another crime scene. And the reason all the windows are blown in is because the explosives officer had to make it safe. We now have another crime scene. So we're bringing more scientists in to examine this crime scene. We're bringing explosives experts in to make it safe and then we're bringing forensic in inspectors in to have a look at it. And we find hexamine blocks. These are used to make explosives. We find homemade detonators. We find ham homemade grenades. And we believe now that they had these because if they got stopped by the police on their way to the station, they were going to use them. So how did they get to Luton? They drove down from Leeds. And how do we know that? Because we have excellent technology developed by scientists. We have vehicle number plate readers. We can track them down the roads. So there's the car. And there's the car again. There's the car again. It's difficult to see there. There's the car again. We can track them down the road through the good work of our scientists and CCTV. And here, look at this. We go and speak to every petrol station owner en route. And we find in one of them, one of the bombers comes in and he gets himself a snack. He's on the way to commit mass murder, this guy and he's buying sweets at a petrol station. What do we want to know here? We want to know how he's paid for this. He actually paid by cash, but he may have paid by a credit card. If he had, thank you very much, we then start a, f a financial investigation into him. And there he is now getting back into his car. You can clearly see the number plate. Let's keep going. And he keeps going down the road. There he is again. Now, I want to come back to one of the bombers, Hussein. Remember I told you that three of them went south, west, and east? Hussein was meant to go north, and he couldn't go north. And he didn't know what to do. And every time I changed his PowerPoint, it goes back to tiny little writing, which you can't see. Who can read that? Carol, can you read that? <laughs> he could not detonate his bomb on the Northern Line. So what he tried to do, he tried to ring Mohammed Sadiq Khan. But Mohammed Sadiq Khan wasn't picking his phone up. Why was that? Because he was dead. So he panicked. And he started walking around aimlessly. And we picked him up on CCTV, walking around. Here he is going into a chemist shop. And on his back is a big rucksack full of explosives. Here he is, just about to come along now. There he is, walking along there. Doesn't know what to do. 
few minutes later, he walks back again. He's just wandering around the King's Cross area, not knowing what to do. And then, eventually, he made a decision. And if you look at the top right-hand corner there, you will see a bus. That is the bus that he put the bomb on. Big bang, everybody's running away. The security guard has run in. And I really like this security guard because he's immediately run back again and he's got on the radio and said, something terrible has happened here. Again, CCTV. This isn't public CCTV. This is a private CCTV in a building. But we managed to access it. Now, this is interesting. We didn't stop just on the day of the attack. We started going back further and further and further. And on the 28th of June, guess what we found? They did a reconnaissance. They practiced traveling down from Leeds to Luton. There was only three of them this time. One of them couldn't make it. He was busy. And there we got them, all different places. There you go. And this is around about, about 10 days before the attack. And they're just making sure that they know where they're going and what they need to do. Now, I told you that we tracked that car all the way up to Leeds, and eventually we got him to what we now know as the bomb factory. Just an ordinary house in an ordinary housing estate with families living all around. Not one of, them, not one of those neighbors made any complaint and put any calls in about suspicious behavior. But when you looked inside this, this property, you wondered why. This damage, the windowsill and the paint, is because the chemicals they're using to make the bombs are so corrosive, it's actually eating into the paintwork. There must have been terrible fumes coming out of this property, yet nobody made a call. And there's an issue there for us about ensuring that people do phone us and tell us if they've got suspicions. This is what we found inside. This hasn't been changed. This is not us making this mess. This is the mess they lived in. Mobile phones. Now that's interesting. So immediately we have another branch of scientists who are able to track these mobile phones for us. Again, that's really important. Mobile phone communication becomes extremely important in this case. These are all the materials needed to manufacture the explosives. They were using masks. These are really corrosive chemicals. If they didn't use masks, it would make them seriously ill. They're using fans. That is the actual explosives there. And then it's explosive called triacetone triperoxide, T-A-T-P. It's a very volatile, unstable explosive that's made from chemicals that you could go into Springfield and buy. It's as simple as that. How many of the women here dye their hair? You don't have to tell me, but I bet there's a few of you do. And you use peroxide? That's what makes this bomb. How many people have nail varnish remover? Acetone, that's what makes this bomb. You put the two together, you make a bomb. Obviously, you have to do it in a certain way. And they were getting training. This didn't happen by chance. They were trained to do this. They had to keep it cool. If it got above a certain temperature, it could explode. And this is one of the backsack, backpacks they didn't use. And that would have been full of explosives, about 10 kilograms of explosives, a huge amount of high explosives, which explains why there was so much damage. We looked at over 5,000 CCTV video clips, and some of those were an awful long clips. 31,000 exhibits were assembled and sent off to the laboratories. That is a huge, huge number. 
And now the question is, well, why did they do this? Why on earth did four men who appeared to be living very peacefully in the United Kingdom, one of them a teacher, why did they decide to kill 50-odd people and injured hundreds of others? We got a volume? Okay, it was all going so well. It's a shame you can't hear him talk. We could earlier on. Do you want to try it again? No? Okay, I don't think we're going to be able to do this. It's a pity. Okay. He is speaking in a Yorkshire accent. It doesn't mean much to you, but it's a dialect from the north of England. It's chilling for us because that means he's not an international terrorist that's come in. He's somebody that's lived in the United Kingdom. And what he's saying is, we are at war. I am a soldier. You too will taste the reality of the situation. And then his number two made a similar thing. We are 100% committed. We love death like you love life. You will taste the reality of the situation. Now these videos were made in Pakistan, in training camps on the Afghan-Pakistan border. And they were made by Al-Qaeda and they were trained by Al-Qaeda. But they had to get there, and they had to get back. And that brings in more science in how we monitor people entering and leaving the country, and how we need to be more smarter at doing that, how we need to use better systems, how we need to use passports with bio data in there, so we can actually monitor who's coming and going. And we miss them. We miss them entering and leaving the country. That guy there is the number two in Al-Qaeda. At the time, Osama bin Laden was still alive. This man is called al-Zakari. He was the number two. And he's saying there, they came to us and offered themselves as shaheeds, martyrs. Now, they were recruited in, in England. Somebody in England identified them as being potential extremists. Somebody in England radicalized them and led them down this road to violence. We need to understand that. We understand, understand why that behavior happens. What makes people become so violent and prepared to kill for a cause? And that's another brand of forensics. Forensic psychology is massively important. I was speaking on Fox News this morning about this very issue that we need to get upstream more. We need to know why people are becoming radicalized. There's a load of work that needs to be done here. And we also need to stop people who have been radicalized and perhaps we've arrested and put them in prison from coming out of prison and still being a danger to us. So this is where the work of the probation service and the prison service plays a key role because when you're in prison, you become radicalized you join a gang for self-protection. And if you're a Muslim, your gang will be an extremist Muslim gang. And you're likely to become radicalized. And you're likely to come out of prison, you know, on the path to becoming a violent extremist or a terrorist. And that's why we need to understand that. We need to put measures in place to stop it. And we know that in 2004, they all started exhibiting strange behavior. And isn't it a shame that nobody, none of their family or their work colleagues or the social workers that knew them, none of them said there's something happening here. They're not the same as they used to be. Perhaps we need to go and speak to them. They started purchasing the component parts for the bomb in May 2005, after they came back from Pakistan. We know 
there were other visitors to the premises. The failure of the operation to date is we have not identified those people, but we have not given up because we have lots of DNA, we have lots of fingerprints. And every time anybody is arrested, it is checked against that DNA database. And one day, we hope we will identify who these people are. It's just a failure of the operation. It's a high degree of planning. This did not happen by chance. These bombs were really well made. You saw the reconnaissance. You saw the care they took in doing it. So what are the conclusions? The conclusions are this, that we can only respond and deal with this type of terrible incident if we have a very comprehensive, expert, professional team of people. As a police officer, I cannot do this on my own. I can perhaps lead the investigation, but I need people that I hope you are going to come people that are working within the criminal justice systems, people who are working in forensics, in forensic psychology, cyber security, because one of the things I haven't covered because I've had time is the fact they had computers and they were using the computers for communication, so we had to get into those computers. And we know terrorists nowadays are using the internet to glorify their activities. The current problem with Islamic State, they're using the internet a lot. They're using social media sites. So cyber security, IT experts become a key part of what we need to do. Every part of this investigation involved scientists. People I hope that you will become. Every part of this investigation involved people within the criminal justice system. Now, when you see that, and it's shocking, and, I'm, and I sort of want to apologize for putting you through it, but at the same time, I want you to go away from here thinking, you know what? I could make a difference here. I could deal with this. I could help this. I could stop people being killed here. I could put bad people in prison. I could be the one person that identifies that bomb fragment that has that fingerprint on it that leads to the arrest of the person that made the bomb. Because that's what criminal justice is all about. It's about making a huge difference. It's about making it safer for people. It's about supporting the victims. It's about getting upstream and stopping things happening in the first place. It's about ensuring that we can recover from terrible attacks like this. So I'm hugely impressed that there are people here who want to become part of the criminal justice system. It's been my life for 40 years, and I've been proud to be part of it. And I've seen wonderful successes, and I've seen terrible failures. But it's a job I am so pleased I got into because you can make a fantastic difference. You can save lives. That's what your job's all about, ultimately. Any questions? Is it all stunned silence? <laughs> Everybody's thinking, I only came here to go to Bay Path College. I didn't know I was going to get a lecture on solving terrorism. How do you become more proactive? Of being reactive. That's a really good question. And I was mentioning that this morning about get upstream more. Don't wait for the suicide terrorist to get up in the morning, strap his explosives off and go off and plant a bomb somewhere and blow somebody up. Identify him well beforehand. That's what you need to do. Because I'll tell you something very quickly, and I'm just about on time, so I'm pretty good on this. The only solution to terrorism, the only solution is to remove the cause of it. We can be very good at locking people up. We can be very good at protecting our borders. We can be excellent at going over to Afghanistan and Iraq and fighting the terrorists there. 
That's great. And we need to do that. Don't, don't ever think we don't need to do that. We need to do that. But you're not going to solve the problem. You solve the problem by addressing the underlying causes. You solve the problem by not allowing the extremists to get away with it. You have a counter-narrative. You have a battle of ideas. You undermine these extremist messages. And do you know what? I'm going to leave you with a little bit of hope. And this perhaps is a tiny little bit of hope that what's happening at the moment with Islamic State, this new terrorist organization that is occupying a large part of Syria and Iraq, what is happening there is, is that they are so extreme that although they're attracting a lot of people, they're also creating a huge number of enemies, particularly in Muslim countries. And it just might be it just might be what we've been looking for. It just might be this will galvanize those democratic Muslim countries to stand shoulder to shoulder with us and really start dealing with this problem. You never know. Tiny little bit of hope. Okay. Good question. Thank you much for that. Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not an expert in explosives, but I can only assume that their exposure to the bombs went much higher because they were standing up and that they got a lot more, sustained a lot more damage. But I'm not an expert. But it's the, the, the scientists, the medical teams that we had working on that would actually be able to answer that question exactly why those people died. Okay. The other people were seriously injured. There was a lady actually who lost both her legs who actually turned up as an Olympic, as a Paralympic person in the Olympics in London. And that's a fantastic story, isn't it? Uh, and she won a gold medal in basketball, sit, sitting down basketball. A fantastic story. Any other questions? It's difficult for me to see, actually. Are there questions? Yeah, sorry. I was looking over there and I should have been looking down. That's a good question, isn't it? Well, I joined the police service in 1974. Now, you won't believe that because you think, he cannot be that old, can he, really? <laughs> Seriously. But when I joined the police force, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. But I, I very quickly joined a branch called Special Branch, which deals with intelligence in counter-extremism and terrorism. And that just led me into this world that I've now been in for the next last 40 years. Okay? It's, it's a great job to do because of the importance of it, because I feel I'm actually saving people's lives. I'm stopping terrorism. I'm stopping bombs going down. But probably the most satisfaction I've had has been since I left the police service. And that may sound strange, but actually I've been training overseas a lot, and I've been training countries that have a very poor human rights record. And you know, I'm, I'm changing these countries. I'm changing the way they deal with counter-terrorism. I'm making them think much broader. I had a, an army captain come up to me a few years ago and say, you know, you have changed my life. I'm no longer going to shoot the prisoners after I've inter interrogated them. <laughs> now, OK, tick the box, you know. <laughs> shocking, absolutely shocking, OK? So, but that's what you can do. I'm talking about you making a difference, okay? You can make that sort of difference. Because what we need is really clever people who have got advances in science, who are going to make us smarter at what we do, and going to make it harder for the terrorists and the criminals. I'm talking about terrorism here, but let's not, not forget the fact there are serious organized crime groups out there who are causing us just as much problems drugs particularly, and what about the misuse of the internet? You know, Larry Snyder's here, I think, and, and the cyber security, the paedophile's use of the internet. We need smarter and smarter people to help us combat these, this type of person. Okay? Any other questions? Yeah? Absolutely scared. 
I was, I was so nervous, I was so shaking, because I had about three months service in, I was about 20 years of age, and I, and I had my first murder, which was a man who murdered his wife, okay? And he was trying to escape, so I'm wrestling with him, and I managed to hold him down, and I'm on the radio talking to my sergeant, and he said, are you okay, are you okay? I said, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine, you know. But my voice was, ah, you know. You never get over this, okay? I've been to quite a few bomb scenes, and I can tell you now, I've never got over them. They still haunt me. And I have to say, the people that went to these bomb scenes have my unbelievable admiration. This was really seriously difficult to deal with. Any other questions? I'm really conscious of the time. I'm looking at my organisers and they're saying, that's it, we've got to stop. Yes, we've got to stop. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay. I'm sorry if I've shocked you. Please don't have any sleepless nights. But please, come to Bay Path University. <laughs> it's fantastic. Thank you so much, Commander. It was so wonderful to have your experience shared with us, your time, your knowledge with the bombings. We really, truly appreciate it.